number of contributions and reflection. And today he's been visiting in uh, San Francisco. His, the CV is long and dense, you can find online. But today we'll discuss on perception. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Venki. And thank you, Anna, for putting together these wonderful programs in a such a wonderful place. So I will try now to keep you uh, awake. Uh, it's very hot, and probably you are feeling asleep. But I, I would like to share with you some uh, uh, recent data we got uh, regarding the uh, what I will call the re-entry loop. So I'm going to tell you why. But so first of all, um, as I've been uh, told to present in a very uh, easy way for students. I don't know if the students are still there. Uh, yes, OK. Uh, I would just like to make a, a, a very general presentation on uh, the olfactory bulb, receiving olfactory inputs, and the olfactory cortex. Um, the idea is that we should give up with this kind of uh, cerebrocentric view about the brain receiving information from outside and processing this information and triggering output behaviors. It's more than that. You know that even some specialists are talking about the dark energy, which means that there are regions of the brain that are working together. And if you have to take into account one important thing in the olfactory bulb, is that the major activity within the olfactory bulb is either intrinsic or is modulated by top-down fibers. And this is what I, want, like, I would like to share with you today, is this vision of uh, this olfactory cortex sending back information to the olfactory bulb. And that's the reason why I call this a re-entry loop, because we are still uh, in the olfactory system. Everyone uh, is looking for something. Um, I'm very granulocentric. And I'm going to present uh, all the data we have uh, got recently on the granular cells activity, how they are uh, firing activity, how they can be modulated in very precise context. So we're going to stick to these uh, cell types. And we, of course, will have to integrate the other bone, uh, the other neurogenesis, as my lab has been uh, heavily involved in, in this activity. So when I'm talking about granular cells, um, as you can see here, this was a recent work done by uh, Kurt. If I can start, oops, the movie. All right. So no movie today. Uh, it was working initially, but ah, it, here it goes. So here we are looking on a, a chronic imaging of granular cells. Um, and this has been done in awake animals, uh, behaving animals. And here you have the days after injections. And uh, as you have seen, we have uh, this possibility of tracking cell movements, spine movements, spine genesis, spine retraction. And, and interestingly, when Kurt came to some uh, uh, counting, um, we were surprised to see that about 40% of these spines are dynamic within two days. And if you do, and we have been doing this in a control cases for the cortex, if you do this in the same time window, you will have barely uh, see, uh, you will see barely 1% of, of dynamic spines and motility. So one thing is important to take into account that these cells are eager to look for partners and what I'm going to show you is that uh, one of the major factors that will control this cell motility and connectivity would be the top-down top fibers. So we have these granular cells being activated by locally by the uh, dendrite of mitral cells. We know that these granular cells also receive very proximal local inputs from the uh, collateral axons. And this excitation is balanced by inhibition provided, as we heard uh, today, as well as uh, uh, previous days, by the deep short axon cells that control the uh, overall excitability of the granular cells. 
Now what we're going to see that those uh, uh, granule cells, as well as short uh, uh, axon cells, as well as the mitral cells, will receive excitation from this uh, pyramidal cell, from the uh, olfactory cortex. And one of the major uh, uh, consequences of getting those proximal excitation, uh, excitatory inputs will be to trigger action potential, therefore releasing GABA through a, a kind of synchronized way. So keep in mind that you have a synchronous way, like, uh, for instance, lateral excitation coming from one granules to, from, from one gemmules, from, from one spine to another one. You have the local reciprocal synapses, but you have also another way to trigger GABA release by this excitation coming to the uh, proximal site of the, of the granule cells. And if you are able to look what are the partners of the uh, output neurons using uh, 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 different way of labelings, uh, what we heard already during those days, that the mitral cells will reach several uh, territory, and in blue are these axonal projections from the, uh, from the mitral cells. But interestingly, in green, are the um, downstream structure from the olfactory bulb. And you can see a very nice mirror images. Therefore, this is why I'm talking about re-entry loop, because most of the region of the brain receiving input from the olfactory bulb will again release uh, 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 information to the olfactory bulb, mostly to the granule cells, as we heard already, and as well as uh, for the mitral cells. And we heard from Alexander and others where uh, using uh, retrograde labeling, for instance, that the uh, layer two of the uh, uh, piriform cortex is massively sending uh, uh, inputs to, uh, these are the, 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 the piriform cortex, sending uh, massive inputs to uh, the uh, olfactory bulb and mostly the um, granule cells. Here we are using adenoviruses that we are injecting in both the piriform cortex as well as the uh, olfactory nucleus. And as you can see here, the terminals are mostly, not exclusively, but mostly reaching the uh, deeper part of the olfactory bulb, the granule cells uh, layer. So we are uh, reaching these uh, images where you can segregate the local excitatory inputs, as shown here with the uh, Tibet uh, cray uh, mice, where you have this major excitation impinging into the granule cells at the apical site of the granule cells, while uh, the most proximal sites are receiving the uh, top-down uh, input or the uh, re-entry loop. Another way to see this with the uh, uh, Tibet mice, as you can see here, the uh, outside of the olfactory bulb, the inside is quite uh, clean, while if you inject and you superimpose those two images, if you inject the adenoviruses into the olfactory cortex, both uh, piriform cortex and uh, olfactory AON, you can see that the, the major target of these uh, top-down fibers is inside of the, of the olfactory bulb, where, in fact, you find the uh, adult bone neurons uh, uh, shown here. So we are reaching this idea that uh, the granule cells are receiving different excitatory inputs and the question is uh, what these inputs are doing uh, for the function of the granule cells. Many people have been proposing that uh, uh, these top-down fibers control the dynamic gain, uh, play an important role in synchronizing territory, distant territory, and you know the importance of beta versus gamma rhythms to uh, uh, control the olfactory information processing into the olfactory bulb. Encoding non-sensory uh, uh, information, we heard from Alexander and others. Value, for instance, are uh, um, important 
for the functioning of the olfactory bulb, and they can be carried by these top-down cortical inputs. From uh, previous work, we have seen as well from, from Noam, actually, that these uh, top-down fibers could play a very important role with attention for uh, uh, finding pheasant for a dog or when he's training his students to find the chocolate place where you can see exactly the same way the dog is finding his targets. His students here showing uh, the same similar behavior to find the chocolate places. And, and of course, the top-down cortical inputs are very important for Venki when he's doing wine tasting. And, and order in the identification is probably one important function as well that is under control by uh, these top-down cortical inputs. So this is a very recent picture. This was at Letreil, Venki. And yes, yes, <laughs> this is yours. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. <laughs> Sorry? It was a Letre, yes, correct. Uh, but Venki had a wonderful wine tasting, and he's going to tell us a lot later on. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so let's see now how the granule cells integrate both uh, sensory inputs as well as the top-down uh, informations. One way to do this is using uh, uh, adenoviruses or lantiviruses to label granule cells, and, and with DT tomatoes, you can study, for instance, the cell movement of spine genesis, as well as you can fill the, the newborn cells with, with GCAMP. As I've shown here, what you can observe with this chronicle recordings, He goes, that the granule cells, newborn granule cells, for instance, when you, you applied all different orders, they barely respond in these experiments. And this is now work in the progress. While after a training and, and a go-no-go -go task, what you can observe that those uh, newborn neurons with, will highly respond to the S plus orders, the orders associated with the reward while the S minus orders is barely responding. At least you have this kind of pattern separation within the bulb, and we believe that the granule cell activity is play a major role in this function. So let's see now, by using these adenoviruses that we could inject into the pericum cortex to label uh, and make these uh, inputs light sensitive and, and, and use uh, these uh, lantiviruses with uh, um, GFP to look where the inputs are coming. And as you can see here for the PSD, for the newborn neurons, that these granule cells are heavily receiving GABAergic inputs, in, mostly into this proximal region, as we said before. We have been counting the number of... Uh, contact that a given granule cells will receive from the piriform cortex and we reach this number one to four synaptic contact per cells, which might be spare, whether this is relevant for, for, the, uh, for the functioning of the cells. This is, uh, uh, of course, work under, under progress. But you have to take into account that this major reentry loop is impeding into this area and as we're going to see now, each of these domains, the distal, proximal, somatic, as well as the basal inputs, will be um, challenged in a different way when animals are learning. And so we're going to see now animals associating orders with rewards. We're going to see, so this will be a, uh, AE, and we're going to see um, animals with just order exposure without any reward and just animals' uh, exposure uh, to uh, uh, clean air. And as you can see here, none of the local inputs have been changed after this training for uh, uh, several days. But as you can see here, for the distal, proximal, and basal, just only learning increased the number of uh, synaptic contacts. 
by looking on slice physiology, we can shed light into these fibers and trigger glutamate input into the, the granule cells. And as you can see here, after learning, only the uh, uh, excitation, e excitatory inputs were uh, increased uh, following this uh, 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 one week of uh, order training. Tell me. I didn't really uh, switch anything from here, but is there any way to make bigger? I can, I can switch actually the computer if you want or make it bigger. This is embarrassing if you don't see anything. Already granule cells are tiny, so. <laughs> That's. Shall we, shall we uh, keep on? Okay, so if, if top-down fibers arriving to the bulb are so important, one should find a way to uh, regulate those inputs. And, and we have been digging for many modulators, uh, express receptors expressed on these terminals, and see whether once you block these terminals, whether you have different uh, functioning to the olfactory bulb. One of these uh, study came uh, when we've been looking for uh, uh, cannabinoid receptors. Cannabinoid receptors mostly expressed within the olfactory bulb, inside of the granule cell layer, where you find these uh, cortical fibers. And so we decided first to record with uh, field EPSP. The, uh, uh, these are the uh, evoke responses when you shed light into the fibers and you trigger cell depolarization of the granule cells. And if you induce, if you infuse in, within the olfactory bulb a CB1 agonist, then you switch off this excitation driven by, by the fibers. So CB1 seems to be a very important or potent uh, uh, regulator that knock down the excitation driven by these uh, 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 cortical fibers. Interestingly, with fasting, you uh, can measure uh, the increase of endocannabinoid levels in, in animals after only 24 hours of fasting. You can inject, uh, uh, um, you, you can inject uh, CB1 antagonists within, into the bulb and show that you are reducing the, uh, 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 the, the, the food intake in animals infused by, by CB1 antagonists. And order exploration uh, was shown to be uh, uh, increased by uh, uh, activating CB1 receptors. So this is a one indirect way to, to demonstrate that these fibers reaching the olfactory bulb might have something to do with food intake and, and odor exploration. Another way to look uh, for the regulation of these fibers reaching the olfactory bulb was to look for GABA B receptors. And, and uh, we have been looking carefully for these GABA receptors. And, and if you here make slice of the olfactory bulb, and shed light for these uh, fibers reaching the olfactory bulb when you inject the uh, adenoviruses within the uh, uh, periphery cortex, what you will observe by shedding light is an evoked responses within the granule cells. And, and as you can see here, by um, activating GABA-B receptors, you can knock down this excitation driven by, by these fibers. Interestingly, if you record a granule cells, you can also observe a desynaptic inhibition. When you shed light, you don't get, oops, sorry, you don't get. Okay. 
Okay, so I will repeat again. Shading lights in these fibers trigger something wrong. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's, I'm not going to, to touch it anymore. Maybe it's going to skip. Uh, so when, when we shed light to stimulate these fibers, we, we get uh, uh, excitation onto those granule cells, it's in an APSP, and, and, and by adding baclofen into, into the olfactory bulb or in the slice here, uh, you, 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 you block these uh, uh, excitations. And what I wanted to show you, I hope we're going to see it now, um, with, uh, uh, by recording a granule cell, what you can observe is also you could observe uh, an, an inhibitory event. This is a, a pure a GABAergic event. And if you uh, apply NBQX, you, you block this uh, event, which means that this is a disin disynaptic inhibition. You are stimulating a, 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 a short axon cell that will release um, GABA onto these granule cells. And, and again, these events will be uh, um, blocked by, uh, by baclofen. So now let's see what's happened to the uh, 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 mitral cells when, when they are firing. Uh, uh, so this is in vivo recordings. And uh, you can see here the spontaneous activity of the mitral cells. And, and again, if you shed light to stimulate these uh, uh, top-down inputs, what you observed is that the pure uh, uh, feed-forward inhibition, glutamatergic triggering uh, granule cells activation will, will, will knock down this uh, mitral cell activity. And if you applied uh, baclofen, you totally block this, um, this inhibition. The, you, you, you get a disinhibition. You, you block the, the feed forward inhibition. And you can use uh, uh, GABA-B, uh, creme ice, uh, just to check that uh, what you're doing is, is correct, meaning that uh, uh, shedding light into these fibers trigger glutamate release and, and GABA-B activation of the, of the, at the presynaptic terminals will uh, uh, block the uh, glutamate release. Okay, uh, but as all of you know, things are never simple. And um, as we said before, if you shed light, you stimulate these fibers and you inhibit mitral cells, so pure feed forward um, inhibition. But as you can see here, uh, by shedding light, you also increase, in some cases, you also increase the firing activity of the mitral cells followed by, by uh, inhibition, as you can see here. And by playing with, with baclofen, what you could observe that whether the still the uh, inhibitory effect of the mitral cell activity is, is gone, the excitatory inputs to the mitral cells is still present. So GABA B receptors seems to be present in terminals impeding into the granule cells, but not onto the uh, mitral cells. Okay, now let's see what's happened to uh, the odor evoke responses within the bulb using uh, optical fibers and, and recordings the uh, mitral cells activity. And as this is the, uh, the optical fibers here located uh, on the uh, top of the, of the, of the uh, mitral cells and, and, and shedding lights to uh, stimulate these uh, top-down fibers. Here we should see an order evoke responses and, and the uh, uh, calcium responses from a population of uh, mitral cells. And now let's see what's happened if we shed light into the piriform cortex and see how much we're going to uh, 
uh, reduce activity of the mitral cells. And here, by using different uh, uh, frequency, as you can see, this uh, feed forward inhibitions increasing at 33 hertz. And by applying baclofen, as you can see, this uh, feed forward inhibition is, is dramatically, uh, dramatically uh, reduced. And a summary of these results. It's shown here with different frequency, as you can see, uh, uh, we reduce the firing uh, of the mitral cell activity and baclofen reduce this uh, feed forward inhibition. So we have this uh, pathway that uh, trigger glutamate onto the granule cells as well as onto the deep throat axon cells. And finally, the mitral cells activity, the spontaneous as well as the odor evoke responses are uh, under control of this uh, top-down uh, inputs. So GABA-B receptors was described uh, already uh, uh, by Jeff Isaacson and others on the uh, uh, sensory inputs. GABA-B receptors was known to be present on the terminal of the uh, granule cells, but now we are adding another place where GABA-B receptors are located nearby this uh, glutamatergic uh, release site. But as I as I said before, and as you all know, these stories are never as simple as we would like. When we have been using uh, vigat cre animals and injecting into the, the piriform cortex, we have been able to uh, uh, look and find uh, uh, interneurons into uh, the piriform cortex. Okay, that's nothing surprising, but, but when we look into the granule cells, we have been able to see some fibers reaching uh, the, uh, the olfactory bulb. And we're talking here about big eight uh, Cree animals. So we've been looking carefully on what kind of this uh, of, of inhibition could reach the uh, olfactory bulb. And here you have the uh, YFP into the, on, into the olfactory bulb with GAT67. And you can see that some of these uh, 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 dots coming from the uh, olfactory uh, cortex are indeed uh, genus GABAergic uh, terminals. And so when we have been, when we've been able to look, to use herpes uh, uh, viruses for retrograde labeling, uh, injecting the viruses into the bulb and looking at different places into, into, the, uh, into the forebrain, again, we found different places where we could find nice uh, uh, inhibitory interneurons, and we're going to see them in a better uh, uh, shape here uh, with this kind of uh, spiny and uh, as well as uh, uh, spine and non-spiny uh, interneurons. Mostly, we, we, we observe those uh, in inhibitory interneurons into the uh, uh, piriform cortex, the entire parts, as well as in the uh, HDB. Those uh, GABAergic inputs reaching the olfactory bulb seems to follow the uh, uh, lot, as you can see here. We could try to uh, identify those population of, of uh, GABAergic interneurons reaching uh, terminals to the bulb by using different uh, uh, cray mice, uh, so the VIP where you can see some of these uh, uh, neurons into the, uh, on, into the periform cortex. But most of these uh, uh, GABAergic interneurons are stained uh, with somatostatin, and, and we haven't been seeing uh, any uh, parvalbumin interneurons. So this population seems to be further characterized uh, to, to identify what kind of uh, GABAergic interneurons are reaching the olfactory bulb? As we heard uh, uh, this morning, uh, are we talking about different subpopulation of inhibitory interneurons? Those who are uh, dedicated for local inhibition into the piriform cortex, other GABAergic interneurons sending information to the bulb, completely different. These are completely open questions now. When we uh, did some uh, slice physiology, just to look what kind of uh, targets um, we could find in the olfactory bulb, what we have been able to uh, see mostly 
all interneurons within the bulb. So this is really puzzling because we are talking about inhibition reaching the olfactory bulb and reaching inhibitory interneurons. We have to, 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 to carry more uh, recordings to uh, really uh, discard or not output neurons from these uh, GABAergic inputs. And what you will be expecting if this, granule, this uh, inhibitions coming from the cortex to the, to the granule cells or, or the short axon cells is by, by activating using uh, uh, optogenity, by activating these fibers, one will expect this disinhibition. And as you can see here, and, but now we are looking in which scenario, in which conditions those GABAergic inputs are speaking to the uh, olfactory bulb. Finally, we decided to look uh, in which occasions, in, in which scenario, these uh, GABAergic terminals could be activating. And again, we are using the same task as, as I showed before with the uh, excitatory inputs uh, from, the cortex, from the cortex to the bulb. We are using the same protocols here and, and using uh, uh, the um, optical fibers, as you can see here, it seems that these uh, GABAergic inputs to the bulb really uh, uh, bring some information about the values because you have here the uh, uh, S plus uh, uh, and the S minus, which are completely different. And if you do uh, the same kind of experiment, but without any, uh, uh, any, any differences, uh, reward or whatever, you don't see any differences. So there is a value uh, information that seems to be brought by these uh, uh, inhibitory inputs to the bulb. Finally, we've been looking and about, oh, sorry, about disappointed about the, uh, the function these uh, GABAergic inputs could do regarding all functions. We didn't find any, any real, real uh, effect on odor discrimination by trying uh, chemogenetics, by inhibiting or activating those uh, fibers. Of course, maybe as we heard from Dimitri, this could be a, a problem of, of timing, but by, by making those kind of experiments, we couldn't find any, any uh, obvious uh, effect on other discrimination. And when we stimulate these uh, inhibitory inputs um, uh, during order detections, we barely see uh, effects only at a very di diluted uh, uh, concentration, as you can see here, by inhibiting these, uh, inhibiting these uh, inhibitory inputs to the bulb, we could observe that uh, these animals were a better uh, performer. And um, we don't see too much uh, when we are uh, uh, driving, when we are exciting those uh, fibers. So all in all, we have this scheme where um, we know that these sensory inputs trigger uh, excitation to these uh, mitral cells. Mitral cells will send information to the olfactory cortex. We knew already in this scheme that the uh, olfactory cortex sent back excitation to the mitral cells as well as uh, other inhibitory uh, interneurons. But to this scheme now, what we have to add, whether this is the same population or not, we don't know yet, but we have this GABAergic inputs reaching mostly uh, the local inhibitory uh, interneurons within the bulb. And the reason why we have this uh, loop, we don't know yet. And I hope this will feed some models and some thoughts and maybe some debates right now. So with this slide, I'd like to finish by thanking the people who have been doing the job. Gabriel Lepouzé, who has been uh, mostly driving these uh, this, uh, experiments with, with a, a PhD student, Camille, uh, who has been really uh, patient to, to inject. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, serendipity was really uh, the center of this experiment, where we have been using uh, uh, adenoviruses with CAM kinase 2 and channel rhodopsin, thinking that we will be targeting pyramidal cells in the piriform. And, and guess what? I mean, mostly this granule cells, I mean inhibitory interneurons within the piriform cortex were stained with uh, this kind of, uh, of viruses. So you have to strongly believe in what you're doing uh, before uh, uh, thinking that you have to throw all the data. 
Uh, but Camille was really uh, patient enough, and he, he did his PhD on, on that. And we, we had the great honor of having Andreas as a member of his thesis. Uh, um, Antoine was the one. Antoine Nisson was the one doing the slice physiology, and and uh, those were uh, uh, rotating students. And uh, Julien Grimaud did this work, initiated this work before uh, joining uh, Venki, uh, uh, Venki's lab. Right, thank you very much, and I will be glad to take a, a question. <laughs>